Hello, everybody. Welcome to another installment of Club Moffat Talks. My name is Chris. I'm Joe. And I'm Ryan. We're joined today by Marcus Lopez. Would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Marcos Lopez. I am a, a associate professor of mathematics as well as the current faculty and residence. So I live here on the Midwestern State campus. Awesome. Good deal. Uh, if you uh, listeners, listeners, big quotes with that one, uh, are noticing, uh, starting with the last uh, installment, we are uh, trying something out. Uh, we're, we're going to do this new uh, video thing. Um, we were kind of talking about it last time, and now we're like, yeah, sure, let's go ahead and do it. So I'm sorry that you have to witness what's going <laughs> on here. But as I've uh, alluded to multiple times in the past, it's really hard to get a haircut when you have a six-month-old. So uh, um, yeah. that's it. Um, so before we get started, um, I believe, are we still... Uh, are we still going to go around and say what we do? Because I'm pretty sure the people who are regularly listening to this know what each of us as librarians do around here. Well, the first thing we're going to do is talk about what's in the camp happening on campus and the community. I actually have Joe's very excellent um, <laughs> um, template of how we're supposed to do this. Oh, I've got that one up too. <laughs> <sighs> All right, so we got some stuff to mention here. Uh, stuff happening in July. Not a whole lot going on in terms of uh, the classes right now, I believe. But we've got some stuff going around in the community. Uh, let's see. Um, there are local community theater shows, Joe, that you mentioned. There are, um, and that's uh, that's really something that I was, in in some ways, looking forward to. But they are already going on. Uh, Backdoor Theater is doing the Adams Family. Uh, as their summer youth musical, and this is the the show that was on Broadway with like Nathan Lane, um, and uh, Wichita Theater is doing the Newsies um, about the Paperboy uh, strike back in the day. Um, they did the movie with Christian Bale. Some people may have seen that, uh, but yeah, uh, and uh, Wichita Theater and Backdoor Theater do both have uh, online presence. Uh, but it probably just to be just as easy to just call them. Uh, they're both local area code 940, uh, Backdoor Theater is 322-5000, or Wichita Theater is 723-9037. Very good. If you're interested, give those guys a call and uh, maybe maybe go support our local theater because um, that's that's always something very nice to do. Yeah. Um. I need. I need. I need to start doing that as well. I've. I've. Uh, I've always intended to. I've intended to do that. I've intended to go see our ball games. And I just can never get the time to do it. So. Um. Also, we have a few ongoing things. We mentioned last time that uh, the farmers market has summer hours. Um. That's still going on Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, seven thirty to one. Swing by over there if you'd like to go support them. Um. The Wichita Falls Public Library has summer story times every Thursday at 10.30 a.m., so that's pretty nice. Uh, and then the Wichita Falls Brewing Company has live trivia every Thursday at 7 p.m. Uh, so, what are we doing lately? What are we reading, watching? What games are we playing? Uh, general, What? how are you having fun? <laughs> Well, as people know, I actually do tabletop role-playing games twice a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays. In fact, uh, I will be, after we leave here, I will go home to take a nap so I can I can have a bunch of 40 and 50-year-old men play ninjas. Awesome. Living the dream. <laughs> Marcus? Uh <clears throat> I, I, mean, I also uh, I also am uh, doing tabletop games, but I usually do that on Friday nights with my friends over Zoom that live elsewhere. We've been uh, we're on a last session of a campaign, um, and we were like we keep it keeps getting delayed because somebody gets COVID and then doesn't want to meet, and so we've been waiting for like a month and a half to finish it. And it's just like we're one away. The anticipation like, is building. I yeah. hear you. All all of my guys are on COVID as well. I mean, on COVID as well. On Zoom as well, and one had COVID uh, last mm -hmm. week. So it's been three weeks since we've done the Tuesday Nighter. Mm -hmm. 
I, I, I do tabletop. I do D&D. Uh, and we're in the middle of the uh, pre-made module, uh, The Wild Beyond the Witchlight, which uh, mostly takes place in the Fey Wild. And uh, that's been a lot of fun. Cool. Uh, I have been rereading One Piece. I'm almost caught up on my reread. Um, One Piece is good. Go read it. It's awesome. Um, I reread a manga called Chainsaw Man in two days. Um, because the second half of that started today, I think. Um, just a lot of manga reading for me, really. There's not a whole lot else that I can do. <laughs> Again, uh, six month old. It's mostly just uh, play with her until she either tuckers herself out or she finds something to occupy herself with. Um, or other than that, what was that? Well, you did say you mastered the one whole, the one hand holding, so you could do something else with the other hand. She's grown about six inches since then, so <laughs> um, now she's she's over two feet long, uh, <laughs> and she has a lot more uh, control over her motor skills, so if she's not happy, she'll start doing this. <laughs> um, and thank goodness we have an, a, a visual part of the podcast now so people can see me uh, gesticulating with my arms, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just mostly been reading manga. Um, not a whole lot for me, uh, but... That does remind me, since you all talked about um, tabletop, uh, I I maybe I shouldn't uh, mention this yet. It might be too early, but we are going to be doing the uh, Halloween tabletop terror night again this year. Um, cool. Zachary from the uh, uh, student center um, uh, just asked me uh, literally like uh, last week, I think, if I was interested in doing that again. And I was like, yeah, of course, absolutely. Um, that's probably better to mention in the upcoming stuff that's going on. But uh, uh, we'll we'll be figuring that out just in, in the coming months. Uh, that was something we did last year. I think it was on Halloween night. But uh, it was we a had Friday, the, I remember uh, that. What's that? It was a Friday, I remember that. Yeah, it was definitely a Friday. It was on the weekend. Uh, the gaming uh, club that we have on campus uh, helped organize a, a vast majority of that. And uh, the eSports team is actually going to be doing tryouts, I think, here soon. Um, uh, Zachary also asked me uh, if I could advertise that here in the library. And we're going to be... I'm going to see what we can do to to help out on that. But uh, that's, that's kind of going off the rails into the future upcoming stuff uh, tangentially related to us. So I thought I'd mention that since we're all talking about tabletop stuff right now. But uh, yeah, <laughs> stay tuned for more of that. <laughs> all right, so Marcus, um, we're just going to give it to you now. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm so we're, terrible we're with segues, and like I said. <laughs> and we are now uh, doing a new thing. <laughs> Well, like I said, I have a I, I recently was uh, diagnosed with sleep apnea, so I have a fun little phone app that gives me grades every night based on how well I do and how well I sleep. Um, and it's it's giving me new parent grades. <laughs> so I think I haven't hit us over a 70 on that yet. So, Oof, yeah, I was, I was going to say, like, how much of it is because of sleep apnea and how much of it is because you have a six uh, six month old? Uh, Both. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Very indubitably. Uh, <laughs> all right, great. Uh, so, um, as I as I mentioned like before, I'm the faculty in residence. I'm the second faculty in residence uh, that's lived uh, at MSU. The first one was Steve Hilton, who's a ceramics professor, uh, and he, uh, when Legacy Hall, which is the the newest dorm that opened, uh, what on what used to be a uh, parking lot um, uh, in 2016. It was built with the idea of having one of these faculty and residence positions in mind. Um, and so on the first floor, there is a there's a two bedroom apartment, which I'm currently in. I'm not actually this is this is I'm actually just in the apartment on campus. Um, and then so a faculty member should, you know, is, is is set to live there. Uh, Steve did it for four years. So the, the terms for faculty and residence are two years and you can do two terms. And so he did it for four years uh, and his wife and his at the time, two-year-old son moved in, um, and they lived here for the, the the whole four years. And me and him, I think, were the only two people who applied for it that first time. 
And um, and then in uh, 2020, summer of 2020, which nothing major was going on, uh, they, they, you know, his terms were up, and so he had to move out, and they needed someone else. And I had every intention of applying, but housing was in the process of, you know, we shut down hardcore. People had to leave campus. You have to make sure that students aren't homeless when that happens. Make sure that everybody's like in as good of a state as they can be without being dangerous. And if everybody remembers like March 2020, when they had to start doing this, they didn't know none of us knew anything about like, you know, you, there was the brief moments of like, am I allowed to go outside? Am I allowed? <laughs> like, where am I supposed to be? Like, how do I deal with things? And we had like professors in the math department who like don't have computers or internet at home. And it was like, oh, y'all are going to have a fun time. Um, so they, they <laughs> instead of doing like the call of, hey, who wants to apply to like move on to campus? They were, they, I just got an email like in April that says, do you want it? And you can have it. Like if, <laughs> like if everybody, if you're okay with this, you, this is your job. <laughs> and I was like, okay. And um, so I moved in, uh, August of 2020, and that first year, we were still, especially that first semester, that fall 2020, when we were virtual, and so I was just like, I moved into a new apartment, and just everybody was quiet, <laughs> and nobody was around, <laughs> and uh, it was some kind of like interesting weirdness, but so I've, I've just finished up my first two years. I'm starting up my second two right now, so I'll be here until summer of 24, and then they'll kick me out, and someone else someone else will come in it never whoever whoever wants it <laughs> yeah. hey you know it's it's always really interesting to whenever we talk to someone here on this podcast uh inadvertently one of the things that they mention almost right off is like this is this is the massive amount of change that we had to do just because of COVID in the recent years and i can't imagine what it would be like to actually live in the dorms like ha like around everyone else right now as this was happening when all of the messaging was like don't talk to anyone don't go outside don't interact with people and if you have to uh shield your whole body yeah yeah it was uh that was always weird for like you know everybody like kind of responded differently to 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 COVID and like don't do things, figure out ways to do stuff. People got really into, you know, into like, um, you know, make sure that you're taking care of your mental health and your physical health. And, and like, because it was such a massive change, I think there was also a lot of people wanting to start something, you know, everybody did this, you know, sourdough bread starter. And, uh, you know, like, I, I think that my life had never been more structured, like up until COVID, I still liz lived as a college kid, as far as like, when am I going to sleep and what am I like, you know, eating? And I was, uh, I was very like over the summers, especially I would go to bed like just later and later and later until like when I was going to bed was like 11 AM and then 1 PM and I would like lose a day. And suddenly I became like COVID for some reason I was like, I wake up at 6 30 in the morning. I do a little bit of exercise. <laughs> I'm going to make sure that I'm learning something like everything's gotta be like, I, I don't know. I just had the most structure that I've ever had. So for, for me, I got a lot of stuff done and I just got like this position, which includes like a no rent, no bill apartment. <laughs> and uh, that's and so nice. That took, yeah, that took a whole lot of like just uncertainty and weight that a lot of people had to deal with, like off of the plate as well. Um, so, yeah, it was and I feel I feel very bad for like the because you know, it's like in the housing staff, like everybody went home they still had people on campus still people that you have you know they're trying to yeah they're, they're still taking care of like dozens or hundreds of people there's a lot of like international students that were still here and that was a thing that they had to work out of how that was going to happen and uh and so that, so while people were trying to figure out like how do we like the faculty was like how do we teach over uh, over internet they were like how do i like ensure the safety of our students is like what they're their thing was going for so i had a much easier time than a lot of people did like during during that beginning part of covid because i got uh stuff just ended up clicking into place very nicely yeah that's lucky yeah i i still recall us having to help a lot of the the professors who were requesting like zoom instruction and, and all this other stuff and and even we were just like <laughs> i i don't know um so that's that's something though like i think we've mentioned it in a previous podcast before but like 
having those new things, it's like, well, we could just keep doing some of these things. I mean, you know, it, it works for us. It works for the professors. Like, you know, there's nothing, nothing that would adversely affect what we're doing. And oh, then there was tons of that that was like, um, you know, there was a lot of people who were like, I wish I could do that, but it takes such, you know, that barrier to entry or that learning curve to do it was something that they didn't want to do. They were like, it's one of those like, oh, I could learn this program, but I've got so many other things I've got to do. That was a real nice kind of starting point of just like, well, I guess I can learn it now. Like, I really don't, <laughs> I'm not going anywhere. I'm not like, I can't do any other things. Life got simple. So I think that that really served for a lot of people to be like, you know, people who didn't want to ever get on Zoom or ever deal with D2L or ever want to make a like, you know, a supplementary material or use their computers for things suddenly were like, oh, I guess I could write this up. I guess I could do these things and 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 learn that bit. So in that sense, it 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 gave that that kickstart that people needed for a lot of them. So, uh, Marcus, when when I hear faculty and residents, what I think of is like the head of house thing at Hogwarts, like your Mrs. McGonagall at Gryffindor, you know, uh, what do you have extra duties because of, of this? Uh, I, I do have extra duties and none of them are the ones they are. None of them are those kind of duties, which a lot of people I've been asked a lot of times if I'm like an RA or like a head RA kind of person, I'm in no way in charge of students. Um, I don't, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm here, I'm like, my job in the way that we typically describe it is to humanize the professoriate to the student body and vice versa, um, is that, you know, I'm a person that is also, you know, that uh, and your other professors are also people by extension. Um, so the duties that I have are essentially programming duties, um, and those things take a just a, a bunch of different forms. Some of them are more regular. Some of them are more sporadic. But like um, the last lecture series, which is a fairly popular one throughout campus, that's something that Steve Hilton started and then I've continued where it's um, the usually it's the student body uh, votes on a faculty member that they would like to hear talk about not something necessarily in their area, not something that they normally teach about, just about whatever they want to talk about. And they we usually do it in Legacy Hall. And so that has sometimes been sometimes it is like their their background. Um, Mary Draper did one last year that was about how Caribbean history is world history because it's a, it's what she studies and is interested in. And she was very much she was like, we have so many Caribbean students that come here and have to learn U.S. history. And she's very much like everyone should learn Caribbean history. It's more important. <laughs> like it's it's it is world history. It is it's influencing way more than you know, people give it credit for it. So she gave a really lovely talk on that. Um, Steve Hilton also did one last year, and it was just about his very interesting life um, and how he, like, and how it kind of came about because he was, you know, he was the ceramics professor, but he was a high school science teacher and taught on a boat for uh, for youth that, like, uh, you know, like second chance youth that he was just, they were on a boat in the, you know, in the ocean and doing stuff and, you know, he's and he's gone and he's uh, worked in China and is just, you know, he travels all the time and is um, and so he just talked about that. So they they it's anywhere in between. So that's like a, an example of a program that we do. But we also do smaller things. I um every two weeks while like fall, spring semester, I usually give out coffee and donuts and things um, in the lobby of Legacy for just anybody who's coming by. Um, I work with the academic peer educator group. So we have a bunch of peer educator groups that are, spe are like specialized in some way or another. And then the academic peer educators, their entire job is to make sure that students are comfortable with like registering for classes or knowing how to contact their advisors or being able to use degree works or whatever thing that they can think of. But they help me with like the coffee stuff and uh, they help me with um, a, a, like a, you know, setting up and tearing down and just being there with them. And so we can cross promote in some kind of ways. Um, and then there are other just small things that we do, like um, over the Thanksgiving break, I did a, um, every, you know, a lot of people leave campus and go home and go to other places. Um, my, I'm from Wichita Falls, Texas. Like my family is already here. It wasn't, I wasn't traveling to other places. 
So uh, we did a movie night in, in Legacy for the people who were just here. And we also like did like ornament painting for, for the holidays. Or we did that over the, the Easter break last spring where it was just like, well, whoever, whoever is not here, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to play a movie if y'all want to <laughs> come over and watch a movie. <laughs> and we do that. And then I work with, um, so uh, we have what are called LLPs, which are the living learning programs, um, mostly just in Legacy. But next year, there's going to be a first gen student one in Killingsworth. And those are kind of cohorted groups that have not the same major, but usually uh, similar majors. They're usually in the same college or same two colleges. Um, and they're cohorted and they live together. And the idea is that, you know, they they all come in as freshmen or sophomore and they, and, you know, they're, they, they create these bonds and they're able to kind of reach out and um, be more comfortable with some of their, their peers. Uh, and we have, uh i'm trying to think of like a lot of health science llps we have you know science and math or education and fine arts there's an honor one for honor students one for pretty scholars and we have uh this last year uh esports so the the mm -hmm. there's like two levels of the esports thing there's like the gaming club which is open to um you know everybody just like any kind of club there's the actual tryouts for the team and then there's also this llp that uh, that they just converted one of the lounges to a, a like kind of a, a gaming lounge. So there's a bunch of computers and headphones and uh, for just for that kind of community where they will hold practices and, uh, and can be kind of coached and do stuff. And so I work with them as well. Uh, so we have meetings, you know, like every other week with them and the associate director of housing and the hall director of legacy and um, if they ever need just if they're ever unsure about how to reach out to a faculty member or who, which faculty member they need to be the contact for that's part of what like we would consider my job is you need faculty at a place like what are you what are you thinking of and i'll tell you how to do that or i'll i can reach out for them because a lot of you know, freshmen or sophomores are the majority of the people living here they don't necessarily know who is over what department and what even like the differences of colleges mean, or um, you know who works it, like you know who works in whatever uh, non-academic department. And so part of that is just, oh, I know these people now. Like, who do you who do you, who would you like to show up? So we invite faculty in. We do like house calls, which we like. It's like a reverse trick or treating where we bring a bunch of faculty in and a bunch of staff in. Zach from counseling is 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 very involved. Uh, with a lot of that, uh, and so he'll, so him or other, and then and then faculty members will come in, and we'll just hand out candy like in communities, so that people know who people are. They get to meet somebody in their program. If we match up like a faculty member with an LLP that they kind of represent, um, and then we'll do like small trips or something. We went to the Plex last <laughs> last spring um, with uh, with some of them. They we've done. Uh, before COVID, there was like get on the bus days, which were students were told, hey, we're, we're taking a day trip. Yeah. Here's how you can dress accordingly. If you're down, get on the bus. Like, and then <laughs> uh, and so they've they've done things where they went to uh, like Wichita Theater. They were they went to a show there. They might have seen Newsies in 2018. That might have been what was playing um, at Wichita Theater. So like, uh, and then I they know did, that Todd Giles has done something similar. He's gotten a bunch of students throw them on a bus and they go down to um, like Fort Worth to see all the museums and stuff like that. Yeah, well, yeah we went to the Perot Museum um, one time, the Science Museum, it's in uh, downtown Dallas. Uh, although that was supposed to be a state fair trip, but it got rained out. Yeah. We've got a Rangers game, you know, things like that. So that's kind of that's kind of the job is I'm not I'm not here to say like, hey, you're being loud, you know, quiet hours are at this time. Um, it's much more of a, hey, what do you what do you need to, to get faculty here like who who are you not being who do you want to communicate with that you haven't before where can i direct you to get you know find the thing that you need that, that sounds really cool is is that faculty and residents something the uh, campus is going to grow are they going to start having more faculty and residents Maybe. Um, I don't know if that's the plan at the moment. The nice thing about Legacy is that there was already a place for that. Like it was built with that in mind. 
Um, so there would have to be a place. It depends on how many faculty were interested in it, uh, how many people they could uh, they could get, and if they could house them, uh, you know, in any kind of in any kind of real way. In bigger campuses, uh, in bigger institutions, there's there there often is. I know UNT has two, but like for example, but UNT also has I think like ten different dorms, um, and and so, but there there are definitely some that that only have one in like a specialized area, and but there are there are other places that have like three or four. But yeah. hope, hopefully we'll get some more. But it'll it depends on like how how much we can grow the the program. Okay. I'm really glad that there is uh, someone with with your position there at just here on campus because. Um, like for example, I, I mean, I actually started my first two years at a community college, and I felt like those entire two years it was like I was basically just by myself, and I knew other people who I had gone to high school with. But outside of that, it was like I I'm at a new place all by myself, and I have to search out the things that I want to go to or that I might have similar interests in. So that that is really nice for something like that to be so welcoming and just to be there for for our students. I like the fact you also partner with the peers because I think that really helps because again there is a distance. I mean uh, the college life isn't necessarily the same as when I went to college for example. So um, it's nice to have people who um, are of the same generation of the same of students taking the same classes to have a better idea of what what the needs are or, or it could say this is which what I wish I would have known my first year at, at MSU. Yeah, and the, and the the peer educators have been fantastic. Not just the ones that I work with, although I love my academic peer educators. There's also uh, the VIP uh, peer educators, which are about violence intervention and protection or prevention. Um, and the, you know, there's uh, the you know they also worry about like uh, sex education and and things like that, like letting letting students know about programs that the health the, you know the venison health center is is doing there's the mosaic cross-cultural peer educators there's um epic which i forgot what that stands for but like there's a there's so there, there's i think five five or six different like groups of peer educators and they have like a specific message and there's all there's one peer educator for every i'm gonna say dorm but there's like um one for legacy one for the apartments uh, and then so they so that they can, you know, one for Killingsworth and like Trigg and Pierce maybe shared one and uh, like they they would get together like th those three or four and they put on a program or just make sure that everybody knew about programs that were happening that dealt with their specific thing. So that if it is about getting people more and just involved in campus, there's there's people for that. If it's just about. Um, uh, it, it's kind of like taking what used to be a traditional RA role and separating that RA role out into multiple kind of things because those peer educators are not RAs. They are that's their their job is to just do that. The RAs are there to make sure that everybody's okay and safe and um, you know following the rules and stuff. But these people are like, hey, what would you like to know about? You're interested in this and you didn't know about it. Now you know about it. Can I can I get you there? Like. That sounds really cool. Well, I think we finished out that subject is the most part. <laughs> <It's>, I, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking like what? Hmm. Is there anything else you want to talk about, Marcus? You talked about maybe a, a view into the life of a mathematics professor. <laughs> oh. uh, uh, yeah, sure. There's uh, it's it's or I mean, we can talk about the view. I will say this. Yeah. All I know about the mathematics professors is every talk I've had with the English professor, they hate you guys. Because <laughs> they, they go, it, it, the, the English professor is like, I have 100 uh, papers to grade. It's going to take me a week. I'm going to be working on this 16 hours a day. They talk to a mathematics professor. They're like, I have 100 papers to grade. I'll be done in an hour. Uh, no, that is <laughs> definitely not how that works. Not. Grading takes forever. It is a uh, part of part of that is just the the consistency part of it is that say you're grading something out of a hundred like 
what does one point look like? You know, yeah. people do things way differently. Like the consistency is just like crazy. But um, so one of the the lecturers in the English department is actually a, a a really good friend of mine, Amber Hunsaker. I I officiated her wedding in December, and um, and so w- w- when we get together and we'll talk about this, and she's like, I have to do these things, and the problems that we have and, and the frustrations are the same thing, which is fun because both of the both subjects are ostensibly about like you're making it you're you're making a thesis statement and you're trying to support a thesis statement like but in just the way that you're trying to make those logical arguments and so when she's complaining about like and then the student says this and then like they have this conclusion which has nothing to do with anything that they've said in this essay it's like yeah that's when people are magically like the answer is five and I'm like congrats why i know the answer is five i gave you the thing like why is the, <laughs> like convince me that you know what you did like and um, how do you, you know, how do you arrive at a thing? How do you communicate that part to it? So that's always, that that's always that really interesting thing. Now, mathematics, just in general, as far as like a, like U.S. cultural, like, significance is, it is one of those things where people will say like, oh, you do math, gross, and then just be very <laughs> angry for no reason. And they're just like, how, how dare you? And it's just like, I'm, I'm no, nah. like, it's the, it, and, and I don't know if this is, this, it's got to happen with other subjects, but I don't think it happens with every subject. But people, for some reason, think that, like, that's the one thing that is your entire personality, <laughs> yeah. which is like, oh, you're a math professor. You go home and add stuff. And it's like, nah, like, <laughs> I, I got like, I like I'm, I'm also like a musician. I like uh, you mentioned the, the brewery trivia. I, I was the original host of that for the oh, first wow. two years oh. that the brewery did it. I was like, so. In the third month that the brewery was open, I was the the trivia host up until up until essentially COVID, like uh, up until March 2020, and then I and then I one got this position and just didn't have time for it. Uh, but, uh, and then they uh, at the time it was JT who was their uh, their bi- uh, microbiologist that then started doing it himself. Now it's a couple of different people, but. Uh, but like I, I was I like I was the trivia host. So I was also known as just like the dude who does trivia for a long time, and and it's just like no, I have a whole life outside of math, guys. This is, you know, I like it, but students will just think that that's just like the one track mindedness of that. And I don't know if they do that with history professors. <laughs> uh, they do it with everyone. I mean, librarians, okay. we always read. That's all we do at work is we read books. Mm-hmm. I I haven't read a a real book without images in it in like two years <laughs> so sorry um yeah i have a friend who's like a uh i think he he's like programmer somewhere but uh he's he's getting like his doctorate in math or something and yeah he he always talks about it like with disdain or he's like yeah i did math today i hate it you know i did the <laughs> i had to read up on a whole philosophy of math book and He'll list all these philosophers who have their like this these like mathematical whatever stuff, and I'm just like, <laughs> nah, I, I I'm I'm gonna step out of this one. Like I'll listen to what you have to say, but I'm not gonna interact with it because I, <laughs> it's it's over my head. I I don't know. I'm just gonna say it outright outright that it's over my head. Yeah, then you, um, just, then you just let it wash over you. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Well, I will say this: I grew up in a mathematical household. My dad's a mathematician. He's horrible. I'd be like, I mean, I'd be in like the sixth grade and I'd have some sort of problem. He goes, Oh, that's easy. You just take the derivative of it. I don't think we're learning that way of doing it, Dad. <laughs> and a lot of people, it's that if they, if they, if they had like a person, like a single, like in the 12 years, like from K through 12, if they had one person that like was terrible at teaching math or they had like that bad experience. That is enough for them to be like, I'm done with this. And I'm like, and and so that's always like this weird thing where, you know, people trying to get over it, but also just people just not yelling at me like every time, like, or like grimacing every time they're like, you do mad. I'm like, yeah, I like it. It's, you know, it's a thing I'm interested in. It wasn't like always the thing I was interested in. Um, and I just, I was good at it and kept doing it and grew to, and grew to like it a whole lot enough that I went to like grad school for it. But it is... I don't think that there's any subject that I would just be like, no, gross. I hate it. <laughs> I had to stop myself I, from cursing. I was like, I was just like. <laughs> I, I, I've seen that a lot with people I know where it's like, it's like the Jenga tower with a, a really 
bad per, like teacher or something like you pull the one out and the whole thing just crumbles uh yeah. i mean i'm I, i'm an english major I, I have a bachelor's in english and it's i i can't even imagine all the people who i've talked to who are just like yeah i don't i'm i'm not gonna read to broaden myself i read for entertainment and you know i'm not going to put critical thought into it because it's just i don't oh, wow, you school. actually find people who read i've come across so many people who say i don't read unless i have to yeah yeah no that too yeah um yeah. My dad even, is that. <laughs> even my other friends who I graduated with who have bachelors in English, they're just like, I don't, yeah, not not anymore. I've 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 read myself sick. I'm I'm not gonna do that anymore. Um but yeah, yeah, it's it's weird how how that happens because that same math friend that I have, I'll, I tried to explain to him like what I was doing with the I'm I'm still taking my master's for uh, library science and I was telling him about like subject headings and uh like all all these other like library science terms and he was just like no i you know like we had that same moment like it crossed over briefly where he was like yeah this is this is like there's too much where math is really strict like you plug in the the formulas library science is a lot of like you kind of have to make reaches in a lot of this stuff, especially when it comes to something like subject headings, where it's like, I think this book fits this term. You could argue it doesn't, but I'm the catalog person, so I'm going to say it's like that. Yeah. But there there are a lot of those, like, it works because I say it works. And here's yeah. the library science to back up why you shouldn't question what I'm doing. A lot of yeah. hammering square pegs into round holes, yep. Yeah. Until they become round. <laughs> yeah. Making square pegs round, like that's yes, like shaving yeah, off exactly. corners until 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 that works. Yeah. It's it's what yeah it's it's and it's 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 easier to to do that. It's like harder to do like make a square peg, a, a round peg square. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah, yeah. Do more shaving with that. Yeah, you gotta be a lot more careful. I think. Yeah. The, yeah. <laughs> I I have a weird math thing to to ask you. Uh, this is just a thing that I, I I know is a fact that is, is it's just a fact that happens with numbers. And so my question is, I know that this is a thing, but does it have a name? Like, is it, you know, the McAllister theorem or, you know, whatever. And, and what, what it is, is that um, when you look at a number and you want to know what the square of that number is, like four squared is 16. Mm -hmm. If you take that number of uh, of odd numbers, you get this. You get that result. Like, like you know, uh, with the four, one plus three plus five plus seven is sixteen, mm -hmm. and that works all the way as far as I can tell, as far as I know. Does that have a name? Uh, so that. I mean, not that it's like a theorem or anything like that, but that's actually something that it makes sense if you think about it like a visual proof type of thing. Um, so there, there, are, there are proofs of that that you can see kind of visually. So like you have one squared, and so if you think of like a single kind of square, right? Side one, side one, right? All right, so if you're gonna do two squared, you want a square of size two on each thing, right? That's gonna give you four. So that's like the square is going to happen. Well, how many do you have to add to that one to right, get okay. a four? You're adding one on each kind of one in the corner. And so now you have like a four by four. Well, now you want to do three squared. Well, you want a three by three thing. Well, you've got to add two for each row and then the, the one on the corner. And now you have a three by three square. And so you've added five to do that. So what you're doing is you're adding across the the rows and uh, the rows and the columns. But because you have that corner piece, it's just the next odd number up right. uh, is, is what ends up happening. So it's. It's it, and this happens a whole lot in math where it's there's like there's this thing what do I call it and sometimes it's just like no those are just they're related because it's just a different way of looking at the same the same deal uh -huh. um, and so so there, there's an entire th this shows up in kind of like a lot of publications directed towards like undergraduate math students where they'll they'll show just kind of proof by picture where like there's proof or proof without words is what it's called in one of the uh, I think the College Mathematics Journal, where it's just like, here's a thing, and here's a photo. Okay. And, then, and that's like, that's all the explanation <laughs> that we're given. Please say you understand it now. So without any of the, the the speaking part of it, or without any of the written out, like, you know, take this to be that, and you know, let's let's work it out. They're just like, 
do you see? <laughs> it's the you see why that's true. So yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting thing that people, you know, it's it's a weird pattern that you see, and you're like, why is that? Sometimes it's coincidence. Sometimes it's oh, because what we're really doing can be thought of in multiple ways. And if we just if we rearrange it, Pascal's triangle is a, is a is a hugely great example of that. And that's where you you take like the number one, and then for like the top of a triangle. And then you have one one for the second one, and then you what you end up doing is every next layer you just add the ones above it, the two like so the one and the one would make a two, and then you'll have ones on the outside, and then you have like one three three one for the next layer, and you you can keep doing that, and that, and so that has so many different <laughs> uh, patterns just in it. It tells you like the coefficients of polynomials when you expand them. It has powers of two as the sum of the rows. If you look at it a specific diagonal way, you get the prime numbers in order. If you look at it and it's just like, what do all of these have to do with each other? Like nothing really. It's just you know, like it's the is that these patterns are inherent to how like num you know they're inherent to numbers. And if we look at it a bunch of different ways, we'll see a bunch of different patterns. And it's interesting that you can do that. Like. Uh, uh, but it's not the, being able to revisualize it usually doesn't you don't usually name that part yeah okay i now understand how to visualize square square numbers so thank you <laughs> now i get it now <laughs> yeah let me I'm blow your mind with cubics like, like, like no! <laughs> yeah that that stuff though is just i i'm I, I want to say that when I was younger, I was like fiercely jealous of people who were like just so just just understood numbers in that kind of like three dimensional way. But now I'm just I, I, I have a lot of admiration for that because it's like that's one of the ways in which we're also different is like the ways that we kind of comprehend the world around us in different ways. And there are things that we get. There are things we don't get. And it's. It's nice to see everyone flourishing in their little bubbles. Like, you really know how to do this thing, so I want to see you do it as best as you can. <laughs> and it's weird how people are like that. I was uh, actually a physics student my first two years in college. I was really good at angular momentum. I mean, people blow me up. They'd be, how did you know that? I'm like, it's just a seesaw is all you have to think about. <laughs> but I, the rest of it, it just wasn't working for me. But it's interesting that there's there's always one or two things that just, you know, that you will get, you will understand uh, very well. And that's one of the things that, like, you know, that people, when they do education, specifically, like, in West College of Education, like, that's the thing that you that you worry about is that it's not so much that you understand the thing if your job is to impart the thing. Right. Like it's like I can understand it and that doesn't do anything for anybody. And this is like we have a we have an entire class called structures of the number system. And it's for like elementary level mathematics uh, teachers. Like so like that they're going to be they're going to teach mathematics on like fifth grade and down. And it's frustrating for them because they now have to think about like subtraction in five different ways, none of which is the way that they learned what subtraction was. Oh, yeah. But, yeah. But the reason that you learn it is because it's like, well, they're like, that doesn't make sense to me. And it's like, well, this is how we're trying to do it. And it was like, but why? This is how subtraction works. Like, because if a student doesn't get that way of learning subtraction, you now have seven different models you can pull from and say, like, well, what if we think about it like this? And it might be one of those things like angular, angular momentum was where it's like, Oh, I get that. Like, I just get that. Like, it just, I just didn't see it presented this way. And um, so that's always like this, this, this weird, that, that's, it's always like a weird thing of like, I know you know how to subtract things. You are a, you're like a junior in college. I know you can subtract. <laughs> that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about how we communicate subtraction to children. <laughs> like, it's a, yeah. that's one of the reasons why, I mean, I've had, I had so many people in my family asking me if I would ever consider being a, a grade school teacher. And I said, absolutely not. I, there's no way that I'd be able to know like how to communicate like what I learned in college and what I know now. And just, you know, as you grow up, you, you find new ways that you understand the world around you. And I don't know if I could get to that point anymore where things are so bright and colorful and, and happy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't know if I could, if I could, go to that point ever again but yeah. as 
a librarian, as an instruction librarian in particular, I know how to help people find that stuff on their own. Yeah, and we even do that in library when we, we're teaching the library classes. We may have to explain something three different ways mm -hmm. to get to that point where they finally understand what we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, like it, it, any 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 time that could, any type the time that you're communicating with other people and just like I need you to know something that I already know. It's always like, all right, yeah. let me try it five ways. Let me let me see what I can do. Our problem is usually with wording, just because uh, it. it We'll change something because someone else was confused by that wording, but then what we change it to will confuse two times as many people because we changed. That's our hardest problem is trying to to find the best type of wording to try to explain something. And sometimes it requires multiple attempts. I, yeah. I'm going I'm going to annoy both of you or possibly all three of you actually because this uh <laughs> this um assuming you're not annoyed by me already, but um. Something that I think Ryan and I talked about uh, for a previous class that I was in was um, the actual terminology used in libraries, like in, in library school, is totally different from what people use, like just just normally, like in like conversationally or whatever. So when I teach those classes, I try to use them in words that I would want to hear them, because I said like subject headings and subject terms and stuff earlier. That's not really what people are going to look at. It's not even what it's going to look like on the databases. It's going to be like some other term like. Um, I will point out, Chris, there is an end to that, though, because subject headings, people know subject headings now. They call them. Um, um, eh, my brain's going. Uh, uh, that's hashtags. why I didn't use. But yeah, but yeah. they know what hashtags are, you know, Uh huh. Yeah. something like a hashtag or something like, yeah, whatever it is that they say in the database, like. Um, it might just be subjects, but we say subject headings. You know, it's it's something like that where, um, like we refer to our shelves as ranges. You know, I'm not going to tell someone go look at the range between uh, <laughs> A A B and and A E. You know, I'm going to say look at the shelf number twelve over there. Uh, and and that's that's really how like when I approach like my own classes, I'm still kind of I'm still taking a few classes where I'm like, okay, this is the term. This is how I need to remember it for when I talk to people who don't know what libraries are. So I, I imagine for for that, for teaching just any other kind of subject, it has to be that like this is how you'll remember it better if you're if you're not into the field. How you remember it better, or even like um, there are reasons behind that, but they're beyond. Like a lot of it is just that you asked a really interesting and insightful question but it's beyond the scope of the, like you need to know a lot of other things. So there's a lot of times where people talk about like, it's like, why is it that like, you know, I can pick any number between like a fraction that's irrational or something like that, or just like, how do I know that there are, you know, an infinite number of things? And you're like, oh, it has to do with the density of real numbers because that is a, that's a, you know, a field that satisfies the field axioms. And you're like, that's like, you're, you're talking to a, a kid doing that they're just like, I don't know what any of those words are. It's like, don't worry, I didn't know until I was like in my you know late twenties. Like that's <laughs> not that's not a thing that you have to know. But all right, so like, okay, uh, you're trying to find a way to convince them of something. You're like, have you ever noticed this thing? Yeah, it's because of that. Like it's because of you know it's because of you know it's kind of like these things. But there's always this 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 you know difference in terminology of like you know your professional field setting and. And and your and your outward setting, and sometimes that gets into, you know, like when you when you read like pop science articles or pop math articles, oh, yeah. and sometimes those are fantastic and wonderful, and I like them on the on the level of like I think a lot of people really got a lot of cool stuff from that, and sometimes it's like you've you've changed everything in such a way to make it you know easier to digest that it's taken everything interesting out of it. Like, oh yeah, oh I hate that. Or something um, worse where they they they. They focus on something that's kind of minor because they know they can get, they can get the clickbait out of that. that oh, statement. yeah. Yeah. Um, actually, in library science, we call that domain knowledge. <laughs> uh, like, we actually have a term for that where um, there, was, there was a – I had to make a catalog, basically, in one class, and it was make this catalog or, or this database or, or what have you and put in the domain knowledge of your users, that being, like, 
do the users that that you imagine using the system actually know how to use the system or do they know how to use the field so when it comes to us like doing instruction or whatever it's like that domain knowledge is like do are we teaching students who actually know the databases or do they know how to use like ryan said like hashtags like twitter searching and stuff and that's actually something like as shameful as that is to admit that's actually something that we have to really keep in mind yeah and the biggest problem with that is it changes over time too though i mean uh the, the terminology that was that was used when i was a child is terminology that's no longer being in use so again yeah uh joe sent me an email uh like a month ago or so i think it was like I just read a Twitter post and they're not, I don't think they're speaking English. Uh, <laughs> I don't understand their, what they're saying here. And it's like, it, it was just like people using like Gen Z terminology or whatever. And I was like, oh, I, I'll, I'll help you out here. Let me, let me lead you through how the English <laughs> language has deteriorated. And, <laughs> and, and I say that jokingly really, because like I said, I, I have a BA in English and comparing our speech to a thousand years ago it's like it's it's not the same thing yeah uh, you know the, the ever the, you know the ever evolving english language kind of thing that's the it's i yeah i always like it as like this really interesting thing of just like you know when do i start noticing that i don't know what they're talking about and it's just like oh this is all right so this is that line this is that this is the mm -hmm. me getting older like feeling for it and i used to be especially when i first got here um was like the the translator to the older to the older people they were like i don't understand i was like oh well that's easy i could tell you like all of the things that are happening or when you first start teaching classes like the first class i was probably like in charge of i was all of like 22 in grad school and and there was not a huge difference between me and the peers that were in the class i was i wasn't the oldest person in the room until i probably was in like here at Mid midwestern and like for the longest time, I was just like, we're all basically the same, but we understand the same things. And then like, by the time I got my PhD, I was like 28 and I was like, you are children, all of you are kids. And it was just like, nothing, we have nothing in common. We are not the same people. And- uh, Have you gotten to the point where your area of expertise is no, you're an idiot in your area of expertise? Cause that's happened to me. <laughs> when I was in college, I was in the anime club. I knew everything about anime. People didn't know about anime, they needed to come see me. I have been passed up so much at this point, it's ridiculous. And he says that, and I come in like floating down like this, and I'm like, let me tell you about. <laughs> uh -huh. and, and it'll go away though. Yeah, I used to, mm. it, for me it was music. Like I, I just had like a massive amount of like uh, music trivia knowledge just in general. And then if, like everybody, you know, that stopped like 10 years ago. Like for me, like, yeah, it was like yeah. at a certain age, like you, you hit like, you hit like 24 and you're like, and I'm, I'm done. Like I'm done. <laughs> it up with it. Like, like, just like, actually. you know, it's you're for some reason, what you listen to between like 12 and 24 is like the thing. And I used to be able to tell, and I like, even out of the scope of things that were just like popular or relevant at the time that I was growing up, like, like 80s music trivia and 70s music trivia. Like I just, I was on point with it. And now it's just like, people are like, hey, what was big in like uh, 2012? And I was like, I know I heard it. I don't remember who it was or what their whole vibe was or like, but I used to be able to tell you like biographies of them and like how genres evolved over time. And uh. there are two evergreen Simpsons quotes that go along with this. The first one is um, Principal Skinner thinking out loud, am I out of touch? No, it's the children who are wrong. <laughs> right. um, the other one is uh, Grandpa? Homer's, uh, Homer's Abe. father, Abe. Yeah, you know, yeah. you know the one. I used to be with it, but then they changed what it was. And now I'm with what I'm with isn't it and what's it seems weird and scary to me it'll <laughs> happen to you yeah yeah that one <laughs> that those are those are like the ways that I approach life now is like it'll it'll happen to you <laughs> yeah that's true. and and it's some of it is is wildly interesting to just watch younger people experience the same kind of like how like how I interacted with like things that were older than me and how they interact with things that are older than them is like there's like similarities in it. Like growing up, when you listen to like old songs, old songs were anything before what you considered to be current. 
and you kind of pushed maybe all of those things together. You don't have like the timeline that things that came out in the 1940s and then like early 80s were very far apart. They were they were all old. And then but now like the kids that are coming up are like, yeah, so there's, you know, yeah, like Nirvana and Steely Dan and Frank Sinatra are, you know, in that oh, same yeah. genre of just old stuff. And you're like, oh, there's a wide chasm <laughs> of things that <laughs> and 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 then I and I feel very like well y- yes they're all like you know thirty plus years of uh, you know of forever but it's like but there's so much that happened in between and they're not related they're like no they kind of sound similar like it's the, there's a sensibility about them the one that always scares me is where I watch like a YouTube reviewer who's trying to guess what year this earlier movie came out in and I'm like you're <laughs> off by two decades you really yeah. think those are <laughs> um. What was it? Uh, oh yeah, I I got my daughter a Nirvana uh, onesie, and um, <laughs> we sent a picture of it to uh, my mother-in-law, and she didn't know who they were. So there was this weird moment where she heard or saw, she looked into it and saw Kurt Cobain saying the F word at a concert once. I was like, you want her to grow up like that? And I was like, what are you talking about? I grew up with, oh my god, I grew up with Kurt Cobain dying in my lifetime, like when as a child. You know, like, and now it's like, oh no! Now Nirvana's classic rock to to my daughter. This is like, this is like putting her in a in a Led Zeppelin shirt. No, no, it's worse than that, Chris. It's worse than that. <laughs> the stuff that's being played now will be classic rock to your daughter. Oh, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so, <laughs> and the the and the sad part about this is that. That you can't name somebody right now that will be classic rock to your daughter. <laughs> no. no. Oh, this hurts. This hurts my head. Yeah. <laughs> time keeps moving on. Right? The, the, yeah. the only thing time that keeps on slipping. Time really, about that is that like if I'm in a if I'm in a grocery store, ten twenty years from now, and they're playing the Muzak version of some Justin Bieber song. I won't know what it is. Ooh. <laughs> the, uh, Have you ever been in a restaurant and heard the pan flute version of uh, that Titanic song? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's weird. It's like, what? who made this? <laughs> well, it's, uh, or, or, or when you go to like, uh, I'll, I'll say Olive Garden because this is the place that I, I know that it happens. Because we hear your Italian music. Yeah. Uh, oh, which, is, yeah. which is not the same thing as like, non-italian music yeah uh yeah it's 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 very odd um well by the i way, hate to be the one to do this but when you start wrapping up this has been of course another episode of get up my lawn you young punks <laughs> uh, but by the way before i forget um uh big r.i.p to tony sirico mm-hmm. uh one of my favorite actors on the sopranos that that ruined my whole weekend uh and i'll be re-watching that series again soon god what a what a what a bummer now people are sharing pictures of him and um tony soprano i can't remember his name um, James uh gandolfini yeah gandolfini james gandolfini together like it's just them on the set and it's just like i feel like someone's tearing my heart out mm. good lord uh also, anyway did, didn't james condit from the godfather just also he just i mean and, and from yeah Con, did, movies, Con just, uh, passed away too good lord yeah. And I'm not seeing a lot a online about him right connection. now, too, which is interesting. Uh, a weird point of connection. There was a, a guy that I went to uh, college here with, uh, Steve Allen. Uh, he was in the theater program here at MSU. He's actually a character actor now, uh, and uh, I've seen him in a few things. He's the guy that I told you was in an episode of uh, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. The gang gets invincible. Yeah, and uh, he did an episode of Bosch that I saw recently. He did an episode of, uh, what was it, Vegas, where he gets like slammed into a counter by Khan. <laughs> okay, cool. So I was all like, hey. That's that's one that's one on-screen beating he'll never forget now. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, we we should probably start wrapping up. It's uh it's it's been quite a bit and I know we say this at the end of every episode I think, but it's like I I wish we could just keep talking about this subject forever, but 
you've got places to be, we've got stuff to do, and I'm sure our listeners have checked out probably around the time when we said it's over. <laughs> <laughs> um, so before uh, it gets too long, I'm going to mention some of the upcoming things that uh, that Joe wrote down. Um, fall semester starts on the 22nd. Deadline for app for enrollment is the 1st of, of August. Uh, the next uh, after hours art walk is August fourth. Um, th that's always really nice. I, I I don't think I've ever had a much of a really horrible experience with it. Sometimes you'll have people who like their whole families will be like in a row taking up the entire sidewalk, and that's frustrating. But uh, if you say excuse me loud enough and rude enough, they usually move. <laughs> um, the hotter in hell hundred is August twenty seventh. Uh, we might actually see someone die of heat stroke out there. Um, That's always what we hope for. You know. But really, though, if you're... <laughs> How do you think they bring the fans to the show? I mean, come on. But really, though, if you're going to if you're gonna participate in that, please be careful. We're having record-breaking heat, like, right now. I can't even imagine what it's going to be like in late August. That's It's going to be miserable, so take care of yourself out there. There's usually um, somebody who gets medevaced out because of, because of, of, like, on normal years. Like, somebody gets uh, yeah. in a lot of trouble. So I, I don't want to read on the news that some something bad, someone got really bad sick or, or injured or something because of it. Just take care of yourself out there. I remember one year it rained. I'd be like, oh, that's not fair. They came here actually for heat training. That's sad. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So anything in our departments, uh, Marcus, anything going on with you at the moment or here soon? Uh, no, because it's summer, so I... So like most faculty, I, uh, like um, it's iffy that I'm, uh, if I'm an employee or not. Like you know, we're on nine month contracts, and so like oh, even yeah. though I live here over the summer, I am teaching a class on, but it's online and stuff. But nothing major is happening usually faculty wise uh, during this time. There is a drum corps, uh, uh, the uh, the guardians that live on campus. They're currently my neighbors right now. The oh. Just, so I have so I just so the symbol line is practicing outside most days, and that's annoying. Um, <laughs> so if you see if you see people practicing symbols, just applaud them and say you've got it. No need to practice anymore. You've, you've nailed the line. <laughs> Go inside. Uh, <laughs> keyboards are practicing out on the quad in front of the uh, uh, administration building, and the main percussion drum line is practicing out by the Coliseum. Yeah, uh, I have told myself. Every day this last week, like I have to go back to work. I'm not going to sit here and watch the drum line. I was in percussion in high school. Me too. I probably yo oh, you too. Oh, awesome. I think there was someone else who we've had on the podcast before who who also might have said that. But yeah, what'd you play? Uh I was I was a tenor player, but I mean like like right here, like I have a there's my I have a ah, like, set. Like in, in Awesome. You know. I, I was I thought I was like, that looks like a practice symbol there in the corner. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I was. I I don't have enough coordination, like hand eye, like whatever. I I can't even read actual sheet music. I I can only do like <laughs> percussion sheet reading. But um, yeah, I was I was a tenor quince uh, my junior year and snare my senior. Uh, first two years was bass because that's mm -hmm. what they put the untalented people on. Yeah, I was uh, I was I was bass in seventh grade, and I think I was tenor from the, from then on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I say that, but like I've seen some of the drumline like sheet music for for bass, and it's like Ooh, it's yeah. like reading a nightmare. <laughs> like that stuff is is utterly insane. The the people who get like when they see math and they get like uh uh you know they, they get tense like the math anxiety that happens mm -hmm. it's that that's what that that's what bass bass drum music can look like. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. That's at, that, yeah, it yeah. really is because. Because you have to you have to visualize what that music's gonna sound like, and then you have to visualize it without anyone else's parts except for yours. Mm -hmm. And if you're playing like like syncopated sixteenth notes or something for several measures, I have to imagine it's just like uh, like I, I don't even remember what hand's supposed to be playing right now. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if you want to go watch them practice, they're out all over campus. The, re the um, marimbas are quite relaxing. <laughs> so. That's what it is. Not not keyboards, marimbas. Yeah. Yeah, I'll go outside. I'll hear him practice all day. Uh, but yeah, we like I said before, I, I kind of mentioned it, but uh, Halloween, we're going to be doing probably doing uh, Halloween uh, tabletop terror night. Um, we'll have more information about that later. Uh, Zach and I have to uh, figure out exactly how we're going to to market that and, and actually set it up. Uh, but um, esports tryouts are beginning 
you need to join the Discord or I believe actually just go and talk to them and, and figure out what's going on there because they do meet up on campus. So if you're interested in that, uh, yeah, we'll, there, there are going to be signages and, and other kind of, of things for the Discord all around campus here soon. Uh, Joe, you want to talk about our guests next week? Uh, yes, uh, August uh, podcast, we should have uh, Scotty and Shannon Coppage. Uh, they have their own podcast. They do a uh, mac and cheese movie uh, podcast, uh, but they also do a thing where they provide foster care for dogs. Where they'll have a dog in their care for a little while, and then the dog will go on to its forever home. That's nice. Well, on that note, uh, I believe we're going to say goodbye now. Yep. Uh, Marcus, I'm so glad that we got you on. Uh, if there, like, if if there are any other topics you want to come on and be like, hey, I, I just thought of this thing, I want to come back on and talk, you know, or something like that, or, or we'll probably throw you an email at one point and say, please come back on. <laughs> at at some it. point. So yeah, we I had a great time talking. I did. I did too. It was, it was a lot of fun. Cool. Awesome. Uh, we'll try to get this one up fairly reasonably soon. So uh, we'll let you know when it comes up. Go me. All right. From Moffat Library, everyone involved, uh, thank you all for listening, and we will see you on the next one. Bye.